welcome to Talking Royals, your weekly podcast from ITV News on all things royal. And as it happens this week, all things royal tour. Because if you're watching last week's podcast, you know we were in Sydney. Uh, hard to believe that uh, <laughs> we're now in Samoa. Um, let's talk. We're, we're running through the program in a minute. I'm Chris Shipp, ITV's royal editor. You are Lizzie Robinson, uh, ITV News's royal producer. And we are in. Samoa. Samoa. A um, pretty great location to do a podcast. So have you ever been to Samoa before? No, have My you? My first time too. No. So um, new stamps for both of us. A kind of, uh, kind of a first time for the king and queen on an official visit. Yes, we've we've debated this quite a lot. The king has been here once, yeah. uh, very quickly, uh, unofficially, but this is a uh, first official visit for. I keep both saying of it's them. his first visit. Lizzie says no, he did come here in 1970 something or other on a boat when he was in the navy. He did. But, uh, that's that's. True. <laughs> yes, you're right. So, um, well, anyway, welcome. We, we, listen, we, we, I mean, there's always so much to catch up on. I mean, it's, it's hard to know where we started. We last left you in this podcast when uh, they hadn't even arrived. I think they're probably in the air when we recorded it. Um, they landed, a lot's happened. We've had uh, protests in Parliament. We've had massive crowds at Sydney Opera House. We have had um, some very uh, interesting moments in Samoa as well. Beautiful country. There's been a Commonwealth Heads of Government Summit. We went to the opening ceremony this morning. The, King has spoken about or referred to reparations and slavery. I mean, we could start at the very beginning when it rained in Australia. Oh my goodness! It didn't just rain; it was it biblical. Really, re yeah. when it rains, it really, really rains. And uh, we literally just—we were all sort of all the media were waiting outside the airport, and Charlie, our cameraman, said, "Oh, uh, this isn't going to be good." And I was thinking, "Oh, it'll be fine." Oh, he had a really just, fancy sort of yeah, app, didn't we'll he? We'll just get the of, umbrellas yeah. up. We'll be fine. Yeah. And yeah, it really, really hammered. I mean, it was bouncing off the ground, wasn't it? But thankfully, it did stop. Um, the thing is, I complained about the weather when I was on some Australian breakfast shows uh, talking about the visit, and they were said, "How dare you? You're a Brit complaining about our weather." But it was bad, wasn't it? Um, anyway, so there was a very kind of cautious arrival for uh, the king and queen because they. The, the steps were very wet, um, but this was, I mean, the significance, and we spoke about this last week, this was the king arriving in Australia as the king of Australia for the very first time. Yeah, it was a really historic moment, wasn't it? Being there and watching him come down those steps, both of them gingerly, um, and stepping off the steps onto Australian soil for mm. the first time as king. But he's been there many times before, so yes. like 17 times, wasn't it? So I think this Talk is about the rain, we've got the rain. A little bit of rain, but we've, we've had a lot of rain in Samoa as well, to be <laughs> fair. Um, we were, I posted a couple of pictures on my Instagram stories about what life is like on Royal Tour. <laughs> and it's everyone thinks it's all beaches and, and no. Um, no. <laughs> it's we, a lot of buses. It's a lot of um, logistics lot of moving from like engagement to engagement to engagement. And if you miss the bus, You'd never miss the bus. Never and then also, the also like, so we'll do one, the BBC will do one, Sky will do another, and then we'll kind of like, can we, we have your card and you just swap that thing, and then yeah. we leapfrog, so everything's covered. And but we're it's... swapping cards on buses, yeah. trying to get all the material in so that at the end of the day that we can then sit down and edit it all and sort of um, and often, tell the story of the day. As we were yesterday in Samoa in a national park in a rainforest, and as I think I put in a script, it's not called a rainforest for nothing. No. It, <laughs> there was another moment of rain. Listen, uh, looking back, um, let's not go through day by day, but but in terms of highlights, what would you say? So I think I've definitely got a highlight in Australia and a highlight in Samoa. Australia for me was um, the being at the Sydney Opera House. It was a gorgeous afternoon, huge crowds. We think about 10,000 people had gathered to see them. They walked down the steps of the Opera House and met all the people. And I think we really got a sense of, you know, how excited Australians were to meet them and the kind of the warmth of the reception that they'd had and I sort of wondered you know how many people are going to turn out yeah. and it was packed. Do they really care? And we we drove we arrived at Sydney Opera House in the Well we should point out we were in the convoy. So, well that's we? what I was going to so, say. I mean, we it, were, you know, we, 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 don't, we don't often get that we're normally on a bus stuck in traffic like everybody else but every so often it works out that because you did this visit and then you need to do this visit you get to travel in the King's Convoy, and, and I have and to say... For that one, we were in the King's yeah. Convoy, travelling from uh, a park in Western Sydney back to the Opera House. And, and the only the way convoy... to get around Sydney is when you've got police motorcycle outriders that are stopping all the traffic for you. There's a helicopter above. And we took the convoy went over uh, Sydney Bridge, Harbour and Bridge, and then Sydney Harbour Bridge. An, you know, an amazing view. And then we came round and into the Opera House, and to, to arrive there, um, 
uh, in the convoy was pretty uh, pretty amazing and um, you know it was a beautiful light it was a really lovely afternoon and I just I thought that was a really uh, I really enjoyed that moment it was really uh, really cover. good wasn't it I think that that, that was quite something I suppose my my highlight in a way and I, it, it maybe isn't a highlight but the biggest news story that we had was was Senator Thorpe now Lydia Thorpe if you watched our coverage earlier on in the week and anyone in Australia watching this listening to this will know exactly who she is but she's a senator uh, so the upper house of the Australian Parliament, she's got every right to be in every room of that building as anyone else because she's an elected senator. She just happens to have very strong views on, on uh, the rights of First Nations people. <coughs> so um, Monday was kind of dominated by that because of her. But Monday we were, we were kind in of, Canberra, weren't we? We were in Canberra, but yeah. we were kind of talking about it in any case because the king had a smoking ceremony and a welcome to country, which is that traditional um aboriginal or, or indigenous thing where they smoke some native plants and it, it cleanses your soul it welcomes your visitors to your land and i think the key point here was that the king had twice been welcomed to the land which we now call canberra but obviously it's belonged to first nations people still belongs to them uh, and they've lived on it for tens of thousands of years but then to have that protest we were told that the those that have welcomed King Charles to their land found that a bit of an insult. There was there were so many layers to that story, was, wasn't there? The protest, everyone's got a right to free speech. Should she have done it in Parliament? Was she, you know, was that the right place to do it? How did the king react? He'd already been welcomed by indigenous people. There were lots of layers to that. I'm sure you've heard this, but have another listen again. This was the protest after the king had made a speech. He said, "Thank you very much. Thank you for welcoming me to your land." Then this protest rang out uh, in the Great Hall of the uh, Parliament House in Canberra. So there was Lydia Thorpe. I mean, if you couldn't hear some of the bits at the end, you're not my king, you're not our king. Um, and, you know, she, the point she makes is a valid one in that this is land that her ancestors have had for tens of thousands of years. Australia wasn't born in 1788 when British settlers came here and took the land. It's been their land for, they think, 20 to 25,000 years. Yeah, and I think, you know, watching the coverage here in Australia, you know, firstly, uh, Senator Thorpe has formed for these sorts of protests in Hence why the king Parliament. didn't look massively surprised and almost if someone might have said to him, by the way, we've got this senator, she's allowed to be in the room, she might shout. He's also someone that has, you know, he's, he's been around a long time, he's seen a lot, he seemed fairly unruffled by it. But I think, you know, people feel, okay, there is a right to free speech, but what people, a lot of people said they objected to was the way in which she went about that she was criticized for that um the way she did it less what she was saying i think would you think that's fair yeah i mean i think what we've kind of learned from being in australia for just a few days was that the referendum that they had last year called the voice referendum which was essentially about rights of indigenous people was a very divisive referendum and i kind of reference back in the uk to when we had the scottish referendum you just that, that's the nature of referenda right. you put people into the no camp or the yes camp and it becomes very polarized and i get the impression that in australia things were and did get very polarized i think it was this time last year they had that referendum and everyone's still a little bit bruised from it and they're not quite ready for that healing and Yes, Senator Thorpe was getting a lot of criticism, but a lot of that came from the right wing press who yeah. tend to be a bit more yeah. pro monarchy in any case uh, in Australia. But uh, yes, you know, people were saying she should resign and all the rest of it. But I think people would agree she's an elected man. People have elected her to represent them uh, in the Australian upper house and she has a right to speak. It's just she chose to do it in that setting in a very um... on land, which isn't her ancestors. It's belongs to other people. And there was um... none of all land, wasn't it? Yes, uh, there was the uh, auntie, was it Auntie Violet, who welcomed the king mm. at the Parliament. I um, I listened to an interview with her. She was quite upset that the welcome was disrupted in that way. I think offended. Yeah, no. Well, that, I mean, so for me, that was that's the thing that I kind of remember from it. I agree with you that Sydney Opera House was just amazing picture and uh, then they did a sort of fleet review in, in, in the harbour. So almost like they, I think they sort of packed too much into that Tuesday. We've had a very similar day here in Samoa, Samoa as well, where they 
put too many engagements into one day, I think. And given this king has got cancer, we were having conversations sometimes a bit worried about his how he was coping with it all. Not well, just I mean, the you know, travel, but everything else. Yeah, I mean, we ourselves have said numerous times on this trip how uh, brutal the jet lag is and how how you know difficult that is to overcome. He's then he's got the jet lag. He uh, we know he's he's got cancer. He's paused the treatment while he's been away, and then he's got very very busy days of engagements. And there were some days on this tour where both of us said, "Well, this sort of feels like a tour of old." You know, you've got you know some days back to back ten, engagements. You know, yeah, yeah. Up to ten engagements on a day. The thing that was different is they've they've taken out all the evening engagements yeah. apart from the one they've got tonight, which is a dinner for Commonwealth uh, leaders, but. Um, every other evening, they had no engagements, which was kind of doctor's orders, wasn't it? And, and of course, that, uh, that rest day in, uh, in Sydney when they first arrived on the Saturday uh, was taken as a rest day. There was, um, you know, there was some footage uh, Australian media got of them walking around the grounds of Admiralty House, but um, yeah. that, was, that was built into the schedule. And again, we've both spoken about how that's unusual. We don't yes, often see Yes, you don't see it at rest day. So Admiralty House is the Governor General's house. The Governor General is the King's representative in Australia, and that's where they stayed. They, they were the guests of the Governor General. Beautiful house, wasn't it, on Kira, in Kirribilli in uh, Sydney. With an amazing view, actually, um, yeah. over the water to the well, Sydney Opera yeah. House. An amazing view both ways, because they can see yeah. the Opera House, but you can quite easily put a camera anywhere along that the harbour edge and look that way as some of the Australian TV crews did and that the, weekend. Uh, the Sydney Opera House on the Friday when they arrived that was uh, all uh, illuminated with sort of images of past uh, royal yes. visits. Yes, well, there's Australia. an interesting story there wasn't there, there because uh, th th so in order to project these images onto the, the sails, do they call them the yeah. sails of Sydney Opera House, um, and it was all the past visits of, of Prince Charles and now King Charles. There's a really, my favourite one, which we put on Instagram, was that blue one. with the, It was their coronation photo, wasn't it, where Camilla's in the blue dress. And it was, a, it was lit up beautifully. But in order to project those images on, there was a cruise ship in the way. Guess the name of the cruise ship? The Queen Elizabeth. So the <laughs> Queen Elizabeth was late because of the rain, which we mentioned at the top. It all kind of was a perfect storm. She couldn't get out of the way, so they couldn't project the light on it. And they had to wait for her to get clearance to leave the dock in order to throw the light on the uh, Opera House. But it, when they did, when they it did, looked stunning. It did, and there was, uh, there was a sort of a four minute uh, revolution mm. of images uh, up until midnight that night. So great, uh, you know, great for them to be yeah. able to see. They, they could see across the water from our yeah. house, those images. We mentioned the cancer just now. There was yeah. a really interesting visit, wasn't it, to a, a melanoma center where they met two Australians of the year, two professors who have done amazing work in treating Melanoma, which is one of Australia's uh, most common cancers because of the, where they live in the world, and uh, the great work they're doing on using a new uh, immunotherapy to treat people, some of whom had stage four yeah. melanomas. Yeah, I mean, this was, you know, we when we first uh, received the schedule for Australia, we knew this was going to be an incredibly poignant visit. You know, this is the king has cancer and he is going to... Um, uh, to the Melanoma Institute, and uh, I think you know he, you know, since his own diagnosis, he has worked to ensure he has raised as much public awareness as he can around the issue of cancer. And I think you know uh, it being built into the program here was was part of that. Probably just worth listening. We we listened to a couple of conversations when we were in the room with the King, and he seemed particularly knowledgeable of. Uh, immunotherapy, interested in the conversations about immu uh, immunotherapy and how triggering the body's immune system to attack the cancer and they are trying to deal with the or, or mitigate the side effects. Uh, his response, we'll play it to you just now, it was that it's oh good that's very encouraging um, and then have a listen to the two professors who he met who, who run this, uh, uh, this melanoma centre about, um, about their conversation with the king and particularly given that not just him but princess of wales has had a cancer diagnosis this year yes that's really encouraging yes yes <laughs> um, the treatment isn't too bad because the immunotherapy there was there was minimal no, exactly. side effects so. exactly. i can't imagine what it's been like for the royal family to have two cancer diagnoses but what seems to be a really good thing for anyone who suffers from from cancer and a family that's going through that is hope hope 
that you can be treated. Some of the discoveries that we've made here have made a difference to many other cancers, so it's been great to discuss those with the king. So Australia, uh, the, the, the move after Sydney Opera House, it was like bye-bye, and then it was off to Samoa. Um, they had a sort of travel day, that, and actually funny enough, it was the Australians yet again who took their king, the king of Australia, to Samoa for the Commonwealth Heads of Government Summit, where we are now. Um, and then we went a different route. We went via Fiji, didn't we? And then landed here in uh, Apia in Samoa. The, the first day of engagements in Samoa, and, and talk me through your highlights, but for, for us was, the, was that ceremony they put on in that village for the king and queen and those amazing children from the church school next door, you know, serenaded the, the, the queen at the end. Yeah, so uh, the Samoa uh, part of the trip has been sort of split into two days. We've had the state visit day where um, they, they packed in a lot of engagements and saw a lot of Samoa and a lot of Samoans. And then the, the second day that was focused on the Commonwealth Heads of uh, Government meeting. And uh, the, the Royal Rotors that we had on the, the state visit day, we went to this village, didn't we? Uh, Moata village. And we got to see uh, this traditional welcome ceremony and the king being presented the, the Arva cup, yes. which I'll let you explain because you've actually tried it before. Well, I've tried a form of it in, in Fiji before when we went on a, the, the trip there with Harry and Meghan a few years ago. And it is made from the root of a plant and ground down and ground down and sieved and sieved and sieved. But, you know, I think most people would agree if you were to look at it, it does look not very appetizing, shall we say. You know, it looks like um, cloudy water, essentially, which, which he then drank. Yeah, this is an incredibly uh, important and significant uh, ceremony um, for Samoans. And uh, I think it was a real honour to be able to, to see that, wasn't yeah. it? He actually drank it twice that day. And, um, you know, one, one wonders the reaction that you have when you don't try this stuff very often but it's a real honour to give your guest this Arva drink here. Um, now, he had that sort of formal welcome ceremony with the, in the, the, the village where the head of state comes from. Uh, and then he had the one at the village where we were because he was visiting a mangrove uh, replanting project, again, linked to climate change, rising sea levels, plastic in the sea and all the rest of it. Um, but this ceremony that so they made him a king of the village, effectively, didn't they? Yeah, so so the, the, the chap said to us, well, he is already a king, but he's now two kings. Yeah, he's a, sort of bestowed a, the title of high chief and they sort of described it to us as you know, king, of king of everything. King so, of our land. You know, he, he arrived, as you said, yeah. in your piece, one king and left that village as two, two in their eyes. But, yeah. I think but what about was... listening to the village elder who, who told oh, us yeah. about, yeah. yeah, should we do that? We understand how difficult it is for somebody who is suffering cancer and uh, and we admire his tenacity and if he goes back to great britain he's part of us so the village elder therefore saying when he goes back to the uk you know he's yes we understand he's got cancer but he's he's got a little bit of samoa in him yeah takes home takes home with him a little bit of samoa and there's been a real um I think people have really recognised the fact that the King has travelled this far to both Australia and Samoa with cancer. And I think people have really appreciated um, that he's done that. But that ceremony, I, I think, you know, we, we got to spend a bit of time in the village before the King and the Queen arrived. And the, the warmth of the welcome that yeah. we had was really uh, incredible. And then to be able to watch that ceremony um, was, you know, a, a huge honor mm. and I, I think it's the sort of thing Every that when you're on world tours you you see these things and you think you know it's a sort of moment of well you, you wouldn't necessarily get to see that yeah if you and often you're rushing in there. and rushing out yeah. so much it's actually sometimes nice just to sit and talk to people not yeah. even do interviews with them just talk and i think you know the, the so some moments have a very kind of relaxed very friendly approach isn't it very welcoming yes oh actually you know. we recognize that the king recognized in what he was wearing for the state visit day. Oh, okay, let's let's um, do dress dresses, dresses dress code or, uh, or you know, jackets in his case. Yeah, we'll show you some pictures of what the king was wearing. The bush jacket. He, the bush jacket, and I think you know he, he was sort of really embracing the culture and um, and all his uh, team and protection officers. They were also uh, wearing. Yes, all wearing um, some own shirts. shirts. If you're hearing uh, sirens going by, that's because there, there are so many leaders here for all the different nations. There's delegations going past our hotel all the time. Sometimes it's the king. Sometimes it's the prime minister of uh, some other country or the president of um, Rwanda or whatever. So 
um, delegations going past all the time. Which brings me to the opening ceremony of, of Chogham, Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting. Uh, the King made a speech. The thing that struck me was how few heads of government were here. Yeah, uh, you, you were... I was count, literally writing list, it down, you? counting, counting, counting. So the first person that came in was a foreign minister and then a sort of high commissioner for Canada from London. And then actually there were, I counted something like 2021 um, heads of government and slash there presidents. And 56 countries and there 56, so in the I'd say fewer than half. Yeah. Well, when I say bothered to turn up, some people can't, some have got elections, Justin Trudeau's got a load of political problems at home. Uh, India and South Africa leaders, Cyril Ramaphosa and Narendra Modi, decided not to come to Chogham here. They decided to go to a summit in Russia hosted by Vladimir Putin, which is the BRIC nations, Brazil, Russia, India, China, because it's rather suggests that they see that as much more important economically than anything the Commonwealth can do for them. Yeah, I was going to ask you, you've done, you've covered a fair few Chogums in your time, in your last job and this job. Is this, what would you normally have seen? Like when I, you I first remember thinking went to... in, in, in Rwanda, there were lots of foreign ministers, right. not many prime ministers. This one felt particularly thin on the ground, I have to say. And I think partly that's because of how long it took to get here. Our own Prime Minister Keir Starmer, by the way, had to take a plane from London to Canada and then a refuel in Canada twice, I think. And then they went from there to Hawaii and another refuel in Hawaii. And then they got to... I mean, I think they're in the air I mean, for, they, they're in the air for yeah. something like what, 27 and, hours. And we're 12 hours ahead of the time in the UK at the moment. So literally the other side of the world. Um, so it is, so we're basically, everyone, it's, it's 6.30 in the evening here and everyone in London is just waking, waking up. Waking up, so we, yeah, so, so we'll like have to go and call and we've, we've um, finished our day. Let's really quickly talk about this speech then. So speech, uh, let's play you a bit of it, but it was basically, didn't say the word slavery, didn't say reparations, but was acknowledging that there are many countries in the Commonwealth who want Britain to pay reparations for its role in the transatlantic slave trade. Now, King Charles said none of those actual words, have a listen to what he said about the history and what we need to learn from history. Together we are wiser, stronger, and more able to respond to the demands of our time. That said, our cohesion requires that we acknowledge where we have come from. I understand from listening to people across the Commonwealth how the most painful aspects of our past continue to resonate. It is vital, therefore, that we understand our history to guide us to make the right choices in the future. So he basically wants a discussion. He wants people to oh, talk about it, but he ain't, you know, it's a British government issue, this, and they don't want to pay any money. It's interesting, isn't it? We were, uh, we were chatting earlier uh, amongst some of the royal correspondents about uh, speeches that the king makes on trips like this, foreign trips, and he he, the speech that he writes is shown to the, the Prime Minister and the, the government ahead of him making it, isn't it? Yes, exactly. And that, that's, there are some speeches that the, the King's private secretary will have to show to the Prime Minister to say, are you happy with this? Yeah. And this is one of those. Because this is kind of, yeah. you know, the King's not a politician and he doesn't do politics. But here, you know, can you check you're happy with what I'm saying? And Sir Keir Starmer, the Prime Minister, was. But a very, very delicate situation. And at some point in the next few days, they're going to choose the new Secretary General to replace Patricia Scotland, Baroness Scotland. Um, all three of those come from Africa, and two of them from Western Africa, which was the embarkation point for a lot of these, let's call it horrendous, abhorrent, dreadful, inhumane um, ships taking slaves from West Africa to plantations in the Caribbean. Yeah. Um... Which is why Barbados, for example, and other countries, Bahamas, think there should be some discussion and some money to compensate them for what happened. Yeah, I think uh, the speech that the King gave and the words that he used, it's, it probably didn't come as a surprise to us. I think we've heard him talk in very similar terms mm. before. Um, have to be very careful how he expresses it as well. Exactly, so. but an incredibly, uh, you know, overall the, the speech, an incredibly important moment for the King, his first uh, opening ceremony as head of uh, the Commonwealth. Yes. So first head of Commonwealth, first visit to Australia. We've had a big protest about indigenous rights. The Republic debate in Australia kind of was there, but not massively yeah. there. We had an interview with someone saying, look, you know, we've got it from here, but we don't need a king anymore. But we didn't get the sense that Australians were really clamoring for it. They were kind of saying to us, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. 
um, and then the first kind of official visit to a Pacific Island and the first time a Pacific Islanders hosted Chogdam. So yeah. uh, overall, how do you think like, it was received the whole tour as a Yes, I mean, actually, yeah, there, there were some people who didn't want him there. We actually saw some people in Australia holding up signs saying down with the monarchy. Yeah. There was a, you know, we had Lydia Thorpe shouting, not my king. But overall, I think they'll go home very happy with what, what, how, it, how it went down, how they were received here. And, you know, they were two very important checks off the list. You know, he's done everything in the UK as, as first visit here, first this, first day opening of parliament. He's now done first visit as to a realm where he's the head of state and first speech to the Commonwealth. Yeah, this is an incredibly important tour for, for both of them. And I think, you know, the, the reception that they've had, the crowds that we've seen, um, the warmth of the welcome that they've had, I think they can come away from this, mm. you know. And sleep. And sleep. <laughs> All of us can <laughs> yeah. hopefully get some sleep. But yeah. I think they'll, they'll come away from this feeling overall happy with how uh, the tour has gone down. So since we started recording, if you're watching this, uh, you'll notice the light is going and the cameraman uh, behind that camera, Charlie, is telling us, can you stop. please <laughs> stop talking because I don't have much light left. So we will stop talking. If you're just listening to this on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts from, you have no idea what we're talking about. But um, we're almost sitting in the dark. Uh, here in Samoa, there's a, a reception this evening that the King is putting on for the uh, Commonwealth leaders. And then there's a little event uh, in the morning and then the king and queen have to make their long journey home uh, and we will do the same sometime after them. So yep. thanks for being with us. Thanks for watching. You know where you can find our back catalogue of podcasts on Talking Royals so you can catch up with all the things that we've been talking about. But that's about the most comprehensive look we can give you of the tour in Australia and Samoa. Uh, and there'll be more news, I'm sure, coming your way over the weekend. So keep an eye out for that on uh, ITV's website. Until then, we'll see you on the next podcast. Thanks for watching.